In this segment, we're going to look at nerve injuries. We'll look at some definitions, we look at how dermatomes relate to injuries, and then we'll look at a classification system for neuropathies. To start off, we should understand the difference between a radiculopathy and a neuropathy. A radiculopathy, uh, the word radicule, refers to the root, the nerve root. It refers to damage to that nerve root. And what it's going to do, it's going to affect the downstream dermatomes and myotomes. So the skin and the muscles associated with that nerve root that are innervated by it. And as a result of this, they can affect several peripheral nerves because, as you know, a nerve root can contribute to several peripheral nerves. Whereas a neuropathy involves damage to a peripheral nerve. So you can imagine that everything distal to that nerve, everything that's innervated by it, will be affected. And that may include several dermatomes and myotomes. So we're going to look at an example to try and illustrate this a bit better. So we'll look at a C8 nerve root radiculopathy and an ulnar nerve neuropathy. If we look at the ulnar nerve to start off, so if we were to, to crush or transect the ulnar nerve, as we said, everything downstream of that would be affected. If the nerve is merely just crushed or partially damaged, you'll have weakness of the muscles and maybe paresthesia of the skin. If the nerve is completely transected, you'll have complete paralysis of everything that it innervates. Whereas if you look at a C8 radiculopathy, so we know C8 contributes to the ulnar nerve, the median nerve and the radial nerve, it's going to cause weakness for the structures that are innervated by these nerves, but it won't be full paralysis because, as we know, the ulnar nerve also receives fibres from the T1 spinal nerve and the median and the radial receive nerve root fibres from C5 down as far as C7 and T1. So as a result, we'll have only partial weakness and partial sensation loss to the, the myotomes and the dermatomes of C8. So generally speaking, a neuropathy would be far more devastating in its consequences than a radiculopathy. A concept that we should understand fully is that the distribution of your peripheral nerves is obviously going to be different to the distribution of your dermatomes. So we can use the knowledge of these two distributions to help us understand what is affected if someone has an injury. So if a patient has an issue with a specific dermatome, if they have paresthesia or numbness in the dermatome, you can infer that the problem is going to be with the, the spinal nerve or with the central nervous system above that. Whereas if there's an issue corresponding to the, the distribution of a peripheral nerve, then you may start to think that's probably a neuropathy. It's probably related to the peripheral nerve rather than the spinal nerve root. I want to talk briefly about dermatome maps because you can often see several variations of them. So this one here is, I suppose, the original. This is the Forrester map. And it was drawn up based on lots of different things, which include following nerve roots down via dissection, uh, the distribution of herpes zosters, shingles, uh, reactivation, and also rhizotomy, which is cutting of a nerve root and examining the, the, the peripheral effects. So this was the initial map that was in place, um, and you may be familiar with it. The newer map then, the Keegan and Garrett map, uh, newer I say, but it is 1948, uh, was based on a slightly different method. So he actually recruited several medical students and other people and anaesthetized specific nerve roots. He also looked at people with herniated intervertebral discs and he looked at the distribution of this reduced perception of pain, hypoalgesia um, in the skin and drew out these, these maps as a result. So some people would assume that you know the newer map is going to be the more accurate map, but there is quite a lot of uh, controversy between the two still. The, some of the issues with the newer map include that the, the way that it was determined is subjective, so it's based on the person's perception of pain and sensation in the skin. Um, and it's also quite confounded by the fact that the dermatomes are not discrete strips like this anyway. There are, there's quite a lot of overlap. So a subjective method is, is risky to, to trust. Another potential confounder is that if you're looking at people with herniated intervertebral discs, um, what can happen is it can make dermatomes above and below hypersensitive or with an injected anesthesia, obviously, if there's any leakage into adjacent roots, that can also affect the dermatome that's adjacent. So as I said, there's still quite a lot of controversy. Um, a lot of people consider the Forster map more aligned with clinical findings, but there's no real consensus as yet. A useful map that you should definitely learn is this one and basically what it is, it's a point-based a point map 
where each point is reserved for a specific nerve root. So it's, it's a, an autonomous region, so that there's unlikely to be overlap of dermatomes at these points. So they're useful for nerve testing. If you want to test the integrity of a specific spinal nerve and you're lo looking for C6, test the thumb, there's unlikely to be nerve roots from C5 or C7 in that area. And this is uh, reflected in the Asia classification of spinal cord injury, which is used. So you can see the points on this map here, which allow you to test the specific dermatomes. You'll also notice in this classification system, you have the myotomes here as well. So the elbow flexors, wrist extensors and so on. So this is a, a complete classification for nerve injury, dermatomes and myotomes. So I've added this picture here just so that you can look at the peripheral nerve distributions, which are colored, and you can relate them to the spinal nerve roots that are involved in each of those nerves. So what we'll look at now is how peripheral neuropathies are classified. And this is important because the degree of severity of the neuropathy determines the clinical outcome and treatment. There are two major classification systems. We're going to look first at Sneddon's. This is the older system, and we have three degrees of severity. The least serious is called neuroapraxia and the apraxia, praxia is action, apraxia is inaction, it refers to the fact that the nerve, um, anything that innervates, anything downstream of the inju injury is going to not be working. So what happens in a neuroapraxia is basically a mild injury, so something like a toxin or compression which has disrupted the blood supply. And a prime example of that is if you sleep awkwardly on your chair and you compress your radial nerve, you get this Saturday night palsy. And what has happened, the actual mechanism here is a demyelination. So the myelin sheath has broken down. And because the myelin sheath is broken down, you have a conduction block. So the myelin sheath is not only there to speed up the signal, but it's also helping to propagate the signal. So if there's a large gap in the myelin sheath, the signal can't cross the, the gap. But the good news for a neuropraxia is that all that has to happen is the myelin sheath has to regrow. The axon itself is still intact. And this regrowth can ha usually happen in less than 12 weeks. So you have a temporary functional loss, but a full functional recovery. The next degree of severity is axon notmesis. And tmesis there refers to cutting. So in this case, the axon has been cut also. Uh, ways that this can happen is a crush injury, or a stretching injury, if for example the shoulder has dislocated, the axillary nerve can be stretched. Often displaced fractures can stretch nerves as well. And as a result of this stretching or crushing, the axon and the myelin sheath are destroyed. And the downstream effect of that is the part of the axon that has been severed or cut free from the cell body is going to degenerate. And it performs what's called a Wallerian degeneration distal to the injury. So the axon that's distal to this, this injury point is going to disintegrate and be reabsorbed. But um, one of the good things I suppose about this level of injury that makes it less severe is that the endoneurium, the surround around the myelin sheath, is still intact. So the channel that the nerve has to grow back into is clear, it's still there. So all really that has to happen is the axon has to regrow along this channel and the axon um, its myelin sheath has to reform and it will generally completely recover. So just to talk about those steps, after the initial injury, the axon membrane, membrane as we said, which is distal to that point of injury, will, will be reabsorbed. The Schwann cells will no longer focus on their, their myelin sheath function and instead they'll extrude all their myelin, which macrophages will help to clear away, and the, the Schwann cells will instead focus on multiplying. On dividing to form a new pathway for these axons to regrow along. So they'll align in tubes forming a sort of a clear path along this endoneurial channel. Then after about four days post-injury the axon will start to sprout and it will grow along this tube at a rate of one to three millimeters per day. So depending on what is injured and how far it has to regrow that will determine the recovery uh, period. How long it takes to, to see recovery. You can actually check the growth rate or the rate of recovery with the tenial sign. So you'll remember that you can elicit it at the wrist for the median nerve and a tenial test or tenial sign refers to tapping a nerve at a point of compression or injury and eliciting a paresthesia. So it can refer to any nerve, not just the median nerve. And with the axon notomesis, the regrowth, you can actually track the regrowth by eliciting that signal and seeing where the paresthesia is elicited.
Okay, so the most severe form of injury then is the neurotomesis. And in a neurotomesis, basically, the, the axon is damaged, the myelin sheath is damaged, and the endoneurium is damaged. Also, maybe perhaps the perineurium and the epineurium. Ways that this can happen is a knifing injury, for example, gunshot, um, a sphere ischemia, or an avulsion injury where it's completely pulled apart. So depending on the extent of injury, uh, you'll often have you know, very poor recovery or no recovery at all. And the only recourse for this type of injury would be a nerve repair, a nerve graft or a transfer, so a surgical option. So before we finish this section, I want to talk about the other classification system, which is the Sunderland classification. Uh, both are in use. Sneddon's classification system is very useful for f functional assessment for electrodiagnostic testing, whereas for Sunderland, it's more useful for surgical perspective, when to intervene surgically. And there's a lot of similarities between them. So in Sunderland's five grade classification, the first grade aligns with neuropraxia, the second with axonotomesis, and then the third to the fifth for Sunderland are basically talking about the level of damage to the, the nerve um, endoneurium, perineurium and epineurium. So just to revise those, so there you have your axon with its myelin sheath, the endoneurial channels that I was talking about that the sheath will grow along. You can see them here. Outside this collection of endoneurial channels, you have your perineurium, and then uh, collectively in encapsulating the whole nerve and its blood vessels, you'll have the epineurium. So you can imagine that disruption to the endoneurium is going to cause a problem with regrowth regrowth of these axons and what can often happen in these cases is that you'll have axons accidentally regrowing into the wrong channel so functional recovery can be mixed you won't always surgically intervene for a grade 3 injury but often the recovery that you will get is not going to be full functional recovery if the perineurium and the epineurium are disrupted you would almost always go to a surgical option because regrowth and, and uh, recovery are not going to, to happen without a graft or other surgical intervention.